We'll begin the briefing with remarks from Governor Tony Evers. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us again today. As many of you know, on Tuesday, I declared a new statewide public health emergency and face covering requirement, effective now until November 21st. Folks, we're facing a new and dangerous phase of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Wisconsin. As I said last week, at one point, Wisconsin was in a, was in a pretty good place. And just in August, we, bega we be began to see a reduction in the number of new cases daily, a fact we attributed in large part to our mask and face covering requirements being successful. But with the start of the school year and campuses reopening in the last several weeks, Wisconsin is now experiencing unprecedented near exponential growth of the number of COVID-19 cases in our state. A growth that's been primarily driven in large part by the unprecedented number of infections among 18 to 24 year olds who have a case rate of five times higher than any other group. And this has become especially concerning in our campus communities. Folks, folks, our campuses don't exist in a bubble. By design, they are part of our communities and they welcome students from all over the state and country. So it's critical that we work together now to get this virus under control, not only to protect our campus communities, but for the health and safety of Wisconsin, Wisconsinites in every corner of our state. As I've said before, testing is a key to boxing in the virus. So in addition to the funding and support for testing and contact tracing on our UW campuses that we have previously announced, today we announced an additional $8 million for our private colleges and universities across the state to support their testing efforts. But Wisconsin, we need everyone to do their part, especially our young people, to stop the spread of this virus. I know we all want to get back to normal, but we will continue to see increases in cases until folks decide to take this seriously. It's on all of us to take precautions to keep our neighbors and communities healthy and safe. It's on all of us to help protect our healthcare workers and prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed. And it's on all of us to ensure our small businesses can continue to operate safely and our economy has the opportunity to bounce back because public health is everybody's issue and overcoming COVID-19 is on every community, every age group and every Wisconsinite. It's on all of us together. Our statewide efforts have worked before and they can work again. So please be extra cautious in the days and weeks ahead. While we continue to encourage folks to wear a mask, remember that it is not a substitute for physical distancing. Continue to maintain six feet of distance from those outside your immediate household and skip heading out to the bars or to parties. Many businesses found new and innovative ways to serve Wisconsinites during the pandemic. So continue to use alternative shopping and dining options like curbside pickup and delivery. Catch up with friends and family members virtually and remember that staying home continues to be the best way to prevent and getting this, and spreading this virus. And of course, wear a mask. Wearing a mask in public is a simple and necessary commitment to the common good that we should all be willing to make. Because that's what Wisconsinites do. We look out for our neighbors, we take care of one another, and we know that our state is strongest when we band together. So stay healthy and stay safe, Wisconsin. I'd now like to pass things over to Secretary-designee Andrea Palm for her updates. Andrea. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Uh, we are entering a new and dangerous phase, as the governor said, of this pandemic here in Wisconsin. COVID-19, as you know, is a respiratory virus, and we know that most respiratory viruses reach peak activity in Wisconsin between late fall and early spring. If COVID-19 follows that pattern, we must be prepared and we must act now to stop the spread. For those of us in state government, acting now means we've declared a new public health emergency to address the new realities of COVID-19 here in Wisconsin. For each of us living in Wisconsin, acting now means making the choice to stay home. And when we do go out, wearing a mask. 
It means practicing good hand hygiene, physical distancing, and getting a test if you have symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19. It means following the guidance of local public health departments, quarantining as you wait for your test results, and self-isolating if you test positive. And it means getting your flu shot to help prevent the spread of flu at the same time we are already dealing with COVID-19. The new realities of COVID-19 in Wisconsin are stark. There are now 108,324 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Wisconsin. That is an increase of 2,392 cases over yesterday. Our seven-day average of new daily cases is 1,939, which is up from 665 one month ago. Our total deaths have reached 1,265 Wisconsinites. All 72 counties in Wisconsin are seeing high disease burden. This is a statewide challenge, and we must meet it with both statewide and individual action. That is why extending the mask mandate was so important. Because yes, our case numbers are going up, and we also know that masks work. The science shows that they form a barrier against respiratory droplets that spread COVID-19. Mask wearing is only effective the more we do it together. Everyone can wear a mask safely, excuse me, everyone who can wear a mask safely should wear a mask. We know there are some people who cannot safely wear masks and that is, that is why it's more important for the rest of us who can to do so. My mask protects you and your mask protects me. So I'm gonna say it just one more time. We all need to be wearing a mask whenever we go out. And equally important, please make the choice to stay home as much as possible. We were successful at flattening the curve in the spring because we all pitched in and stayed home. It is time to redouble our efforts and work together again to protect each other and our healthcare system. Thank you, Wisconsin, for your commitment to, to to redouble our efforts, keep masking up, and making the choices that keep our communities safe. Thank you. We'll now take your questions. A reminder to maintain audio quality to keep your phones on mute until it's time for your question. And because we have a hard stop today, please only one question per reporter per outlet. And we'll begin this afternoon with Stephanie Hoff from West Politics. Hi, and thanks for taking my call today. Um, so I'm just wondering, you continue to say, you know, masks are working, um, science shows it, but people in Wisconsin are not taking it seriously. So how do you, how are you going to get people to take this seriously? Um, but I mean, besides, you know, you, you, you plead with Wisconsinites to do this, but how do you get them to recognize that this is a risk? Well, I'll just jump in there right from the get-go. I think it's important that everybody wear a mask, obviously. We, we, uh, we cannot afford to have uh, 1,265 people die of that disease here in Wisconsin, and the number's obviously exponentially higher uh, at the national level. But we have to have our leaders uh, set, set, the, uh, set the stage. I, I see lots of, lots of fundraisers done, uh, pictures of fundraisers done by our Republican colleagues who are not a single person in the picture of maybe 40 or 50 wearing a mask. Uh, they're hugging each other. They're having a hell of a good time. No mask. Now, I'm not against their fundraising. Uh, we all do that. But at the end of the day, uh, when our leaders in the state uh, don't want to cooperate on this issue, it makes it difficult for people that support them across the state and, uh, and others to say, well, I guess it's not important. So it starts at the top. We will continue to do what we can. Hopefully our Republican leaders will, uh, uh, will follow and, uh, and we'll make a difference. But the, you know, there's a $200 fine, I get it, that probably no police officer in the state of Wisconsin wants to in, uh, in, in, involve themselves in a $200 fine. But we will continue to push this issue. I believe Wisconsinites can pull together, and they will. Thank you, Stephanie. Now to Maddie Heim from the Appleton Post-Crescent. Maddie? 
Hi, thanks for taking this call. Um, today, we had heard from Admiral Jawa at HHS um, that there are plenty of test supplies for labs, um, but I know that you said earlier that we're not doing enough tests and, and the high test positivity rate indicates that maybe some people aren't being tested who you'd like to be tested. And um, he specifically suggested that some labs should look to use different types of tests besides the gene expert test, since that's the one that seems to be the most um, at issue right now. So I'm just wondering, has he communicated anything to you about this? And is the availability of supplies affecting how many tests are being done right now, in your opinion? Uh, so I, I have not spoken uh, to him directly, but I think it is important uh, to recognize uh, that diversity in testing supply, as he said, as, as you suggest he said, uh, is, is critical. And it is one thing that we have worked really hard here in the state of Wisconsin to do, because as um, the supply chain continues to be fragile, as we continue to see challenges uh, for our partners in getting different parts of the um, of what you need um, to, to conduct these tests. Um, as we've seen those pieces come in and out of shortage um, or uh, be diverted or you know have, have other challenges, the diversity of our supply has helped us maintain our testing capacity. And so we continue to be committed to that. It is something we, we uh, work on through um, you know a, a variety of, of, of methods. It is why our partnership with Omega and Exact Sciences is so critical to having a stable supply of tests on a weekly basis. Um, uh, but it is something we, we are focused on, it's something we continue to work on. Um, but, but he is not wrong that diversity in your testing supply is a really important part of how you uh, prevent shortages. I think more broadly, what you've given us an opportunity to talk about is the fact that if you need a test, you should get a test. We have capacity in our system. If you're experiencing any kind of symptoms, um, please get a test. Uh, call your local health care provider. Go to one of our uh, community testing sites. Uh, but we do have tests available uh, every day, and, and we would encourage folks to get tested if you need a test. It is the first step in us uh, identifying where the virus is so that we can do the work that needs to follow uh, to stop the spread. Thank you, Maddie. Now to Kent Wayne Scott from WISN TV in Milwaukee. Kent, hi, Governor. Um, you've talked about getting people to to buy in and to comply with the mask mandate, but extending the statewide mask mandate is really more of the same. You're taking the same action you've taken for months, and yet we've seen these cases soaring. So, what additional steps are you planning to take? What are you going to do differently? to address this sudden spike in cases? Well, here's the deal. <laughs> Last April, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, with, the, with, uh, with being allies with Republicans, closed down uh, our stay, uh, stay for at home order. And that essentially precluded all sorts of mitigation strategies, you know, whether it's numbers, uh, uh, numbers of people in bars and restaurants or whatever. We, we had a plan for a, a safer opening for the state of Wisconsin. That didn't happen. Those things are, frankly, uh, out of my control. And it, as you've seen the, uh, uh, in the recent time, they even took uh, Dane County to court to, to stop them from, uh, from some mitigation efforts. So the, um, we, I'd be glad that Republicans can come in come into uh, Madison at any point in time and, and pass some things and I'll get behind them 100% that would mitigate and make a difference in this. Uh, they, the masking is what is important, as is contact tracing, as is testing. Those three things are the most important things that we can do, and we will continue to do that uh, until we drive this number down. But just remember where we were last April and look at where we are now. And I can tell you that uh, uh, I believe it would look a lot different if the chaotic decision of the Supreme Court did not happen. Thank you, Kent. Now to Mitchell Schmidt from the Wisconsin State Journal. Mitchell? Yeah, thank you very much for the call today. 
Um, this might be a question for uh, Palm or Westergaard. I, I was just kind of curious, you talk about flu season coming on the way. Um, obviously, we've seen statewide the Wisconsin Hospital Association is reporting uh, a new kind of peak in um, uh, hospitalizations. I was just curious if there's, uh, with flu season on the way, if there's any additional concern or heightened concern um, with those hospitalization numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dr. Oscar will probably want to say a few things as well. Um, I think it is exactly, um, Mitchell, one of the things that makes this a critical moment in our response um, and why we need together to make choices that uh, will help reduce the spread of this disease. Because as we see flu season come into play, um, our hospital, our frontline healthcare workers and our hospital systems are going to have to not only treat um, what they see on a regular basis, plus COVID, they now uh, are faced with, with a flu season, which does always result in hospitalizations and death. That is just something that we know happens every year. And so while we are working very hard um, and trying to drive a message of increasing flu vaccination, everybody in the state of Wisconsin, it's more important this year than any year to get a flu shot. They are, they are available at your pharmacy, call your primary care, um, but get a flu shot because we will, uh, we will mitigate um, the need for, uh, for hospitalization and taxing our healthcare system, uh, the fewer people who get flu this season. And so it is an important thing. It is an important action we can each take uh, to help, uh, again, um, protect our hospital system, our healthcare workers. But, but you're right, the, the numbers we have seen in recent days in hospitalizations um, uh, are concerning. And it, 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 again, emphasizes why the, um, it's important to act now. It's important for all of us to make choices now. Um, because, right, what do we know about um, the incubation period, right? We, we need to do things that have impacts a couple weeks from now considering the length of time it takes uh, uh, for COVID symptoms to develop for us to understand um, who and where the disease is, is, um, uh, is escalating. And so we need to take actions now in light of some of these initial signs we are seeing in hospitals, what we know about flu season. Um, so it really does uh, emphasize the importance of our actions right now to stop the spread and, and protect each other um, and the state uh, more broadly. But I don't know, Dr. Wester, if you wanna say more. Well, I'd, I'd emphasize the, the fortunate thing is that we, we have strategies to minimize the impact of influenza that we don't have for COVID-19. We have, we have effective vaccines, we have antiviral drugs. Um, and, and thirdly, we know that the evidence is accumulating that the same infection prevention strategies of hand washing and face masks and social distancing uh, seem to work very well for preventing the, the flu. So it's in all of our interest to minimize how much influenza affects us. And we have things that we can do. And in a large part, they line up with the things that we need to do also to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Because it's, it is, it's tremendously concerning to, to think about the possibility of a bad flu season on top of a COVID-19 pandemic. So we, um, we need to use all the tools we have to make it as, as, as low of a risk as, as we can. Thank you, Mitchell. Now to Mason Dowling from WAOW-TV in Wausau. Mason? Hi, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking this call, Governor. I wanted, and uh, DHS, I wanted to ask uh, basically whoever feels like fielding the question. Here in central Wisconsin, we've been seeing several uh, counties reporting record daily numbers, Marathon County, Portage County, uh, Clark County as well, uh, that are seeing new record numbers of new cases. And now the county health department are saying that their contact tracers are becoming overwhelmed trying to respond to all the people that may have been in contact. Um, they are currently at the county level pushing for not to get a test unless you have symptoms, which is obviously a bit different than uh, what Andrea was saying. Uh, so I just didn't know if you had any reaction to the growing amount of cases here in central Wisconsin. Yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, question, uh, Mason. And it does, again, speak to the need for all of us to act now to make choices that help reduce the spread of the disease because wh while we talk about um, the lagging indicator and the worst case scenario of our healthcare systems and our frontline healthcare workers becoming overwhelmed, we, we, we certainly see uh, earlier than that the, the jeopardy that our frontline public health system is in 
um, um, and as they can become overwhelmed as cases surge in local communities. And I think what you're talking about in central Wisconsin and, and certainly what we're seeing more broadly because this disease is widespread in Wisconsin um, is that uh, the surge capacity we have built uh, as it relates to contact tracing needs to be expanded. And we, uh, we at DHS um, have brought on an additional uh, 24 contact tracers that started today. We have an additional 60 starting uh, next week um, and we'll have uh, additional uh, folks coming on board in the weeks after that. Um, but we, uh, we at the state are um, working to be able to provide wraparound surge capacity for uh, local contact tracing efforts. Um, but it is it, it really is important that folks um, uh, answer the call when it comes from a contact tracer, uh, provide uh, good, uh, truthful information uh, so that they can uh, turn and do the work related to that. Um, but more fundamentally, that we do what we need to do to stop the spread uh, so that there are less um, contacts, less uh, less tracing work that needs to be done by contact tracers uh, so that they so that they do not become overwhelmed. But we certainly are hearing increasingly from our local partners uh, that contact tracing is becoming more difficult as cases are escalating around the state. Thank you, Mason. Now to Scott Bauer from the Associated Press. Scott. Hi, thank you very much for this call. Um, Governor, in the past, you've supported uh, UW students returning to campus. Um, about a month from now, there's going to be a home football game. While fans won't be allowed in Camp Randall, um, it seems likely that students will be congregating all over campus for that game. What steps, if any, is the state taking, recommending the university take um, to prevent that? And how concerned are you about that home football game, despite there being a crowd, um, being a super spreader event? Yeah, and that, that is, Scott, that is a huge issue for us. And uh, we're, we're going to actually be asking the Big Ten to help out with that. Uh, the Big Ten is spending a lot of money to bring football back into play. And uh, they're spending a lot of money for, for the, uh, the testing and other things of football players. I, they need to step up and, and, and have a significant uh, uh, stake in this game. Uh, outside of, you know, football is about football players and football fans. And I expect that the Big Ten should be doing a PR campaign around this big time. Uh, they, they, they are part of the uh, people that um, uh, made that decision to uh, bring back football. I'm not arguing with the, with the, with the uh, position, but I, I believe that they also have an obligation around that. We're also working with UW-Madison on this issue and Dane County, obviously, they have a mass gathering order. And we're, uh, we're hopeful that the uh, uh, city of Madison will help us also as it relates to making sure that uh, people understand the importance of uh, keeping those crowds small. But it is a huge issue. Uh, I, I, I was also concerned about the, the, the Packer game the last weekend and it seemingly went uh, pretty well without uh, major, uh, major problems of uh, uh, people, large groups of people all over the place. So uh, we can watch those games at home. I plan to, and uh, uh, let's, uh, let's get everybody involved in solving the problem before it becomes one. Thank you, Scott. Now to Emily Matisek from WBAY-TV in Green Bay. Emily? Hello. Hello, I'm just wondering, sort of seeing large lines, Winnebago County, especially um, in Northeast Wisconsin, uh, had to shut down their testing site early, their community testing site early yesterday. Just wondering um, what's being done to get more testing availability, especially here in Northeast Wisconsin, as I mentioned, um, Oshkosh and Winnebago County and in Brown County. We consider reopening these large community testing sites again and sending in the National Guard to run them. Yeah. Uh Thank you for the question. We, um, we are uh, currently working with um, uh, regions around the state that uh, have not had as ready access to regular community testing sites. 
uh, and will be um, uh, moving into those regions on a more regular basis using the assets that we have as it relates to specimen collection uh, and um, test kits uh, because we do, uh, to your point, uh, we do think it's very important that um, test access to testing uh, is readily available uh, in communities across the state. Uh, and so we, uh, we absolutely um, are working to move into those areas where we are seeing that, um, uh, that, we, that we, where we could be helpful, where we could bring assets to the table to improve uh, access to testing uh, for, for all of Wisconsin. Thank you, Emily. Now to Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. Sean? Hi, um, thank you for holding this. Um, I saw the DHS health alert this morning saying that positive antigen tests are being counted in daily totals, but not negative ones. Um, could that be part of the reason why we're seeing a high positivity rate and how widespread is antigen testing in Wisconsin? Thank you. Yeah, to address that. So the this is a, a situation that's changing pretty quickly. Antigen tests have been procured in large numbers at, by the federal government are being delivered to nursing homes and they're just sort of figuring out and sorting out the best strategy to implement them. So they have, antigen tests have been available on the market for some time, but they haven't been in, in widespread use. So traditionally, up till this point, they've, they've comprised a relatively small proportion of the testing that gets done. Now it's likely to think that it's going to increase um, and um, we need to be prepared to communicate that and understand that. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen data to indicate that they've supplanted a large amount of the molecular testing or the diagnostic testing that we're doing. So I don't think that's an explanation for why testing numbers are lower than they could be or should be. Um, but it's a resource that is, you know, we're, we're learning more about. We're trying to collect and generate and understand the data about what the limitations are and figure out how to use them um, in, the, in the, the way that is the, the most strategic and the best use. Because the advantages of antigen tests is they can provide a result relatively quickly. The disadvantages is they're not as accurate. So when they're used for screening people without symptoms, they can result in falsely positive tests. Um, sometimes more likely to have falsely positive tests than truly positive tests, depending on how widespread the infection is in a population. So the, the health alert network message this morning was, was really trying to describe this rather complex situation um, and communicate to all our partners about how we need to focus on the, the, the strengths and limitations of these. Um, but I think going forward, we'll see more of them being used for diagnostic purposes. And we are taking positive results on antigen tests uh, very seriously, and, and they result in, in follow-up the, in the same ways that positive uh, molecular tests do. Thank you, Sean. Now to Sierra Trojan from Fox 11 in Green Bay. Sierra? Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my question. Governor Evers, how will the $8 million for testing be distributed to universities, and what have your conversations with Tommy Thompson been like to try to reduce the spread at universities? The, I believe, uh, and we can get back to you on this, I believe the $8 million was uh, uh, distributed by per student. I, I, I can't imagine any other way that it, it could have been. So obviously I don't have the answer, but if, if I was a, uh, a realist here, I, I can't imagine any other way than, than the number of students, uh, percentage of students that the, these, the universities have. Thank you, Sarah. Now to Adriana Mendez from TMJ4 in Milwaukee. Adriana? Hi, good afternoon. Um, with, you know, when a COVID-19 vaccine um, does become available, the state of New York said they would create a, an independent task force to review the safety of that vaccine. Is that something Wisconsin will also do? I didn't hear the first part of your question. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes. Um, vaccine for the virus. Oh, for the vaccine. Um, yes. Uh, so I think right. Uh, vaccine is actively in phase three clinical trials um, uh, for consideration. You know, w once they get their data packages together to submit to FDA for approval, uh, we are actively uh, planning. 
what we will need to do as it relates to um, uh, to vaccine supply, vaccine distribution, um, uh, and the you know the role we will play in in helping to make sure that Wisconsinites have access uh, to a safe uh, and effective vaccine. Uh, as it relates to an independent commission, uh, that is not uh, something we have uh, discussed in any level of detail. Um, uh, but obviously, if it's something that we uh, move uh, uh, to consider or decide to to to, to launch, uh, you'll be the first to know. Thank you, Adriana. Now to Will Cushman from West Context. Will? Good afternoon. Uh, my question is for Secretary Designee Palm. Um, I'm wondering if you are able to uh, confirm that uh, there may be uh, an update to the electronic disease surveillance system rolled out sometime in early October? And if so, what the, the purpose of that update is? Yeah, uh, so we have started um, uh, working closely with our local public health partners about uh, a needed upgrade in the for the system that would specifically enhance the contact tracing functionality as well as some of um, the issues around uh, importing uh, test results that would that would uh, further um, uh, uh, you know uh, make that more efficient um, uh, so um, we're in the early stages of planning that uh, I think we will um, uh, be more able to be be more able to make a uh, an announcement about the details of that in the near future. Um, but it is an upgrade that will will ease uh, and will help uh, with our efforts here uh, in the response. Thank you. Well, now to Sean Ryan from the Milwaukee Business Journal. Sean. Again, Sean Ryan from the Milwaukee Business Journal. Okay, we have to move on then to Danny Maxwell from WKOW-TV in Madison. Danny? Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, we talked about the WHA and it kind of, um, it's reporting the new peak in hospitalizations. Things have been pretty stable here locally in Dane County and Madison where we are, but I'm just wondering if you can tell us which areas of Wisconsin are seeing those high hospitalization rates? Where are they? And could some of those patients be moved to other hospitals like in Madison if those hospitals uh, become overwhelmed at some point? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it does speak to the um, really important uh, planning and work that the hospitals uh, did together uh, and with their re within their regions and across the state. Uh, Thinking about these kind of questions and in anticipation of needing um, to be to essentially be backup to each other, right? That's that's what surge planning and surge capacity is about in its um, most extreme form, right? The hospitals within their own system do surge planning so that they can flex and uh, transition beds to to different levels of care uh, to manage their their um, patient load uh, within system, and then right you you share across systems, uh, and then you think about sharing across regions. And it is also why um, uh, our alt alternate care facility uh, is a really in important insurance policy that we have invested in with CARES Act dollars uh, to make sure that if uh, that, um, that sharing, that um, uh, working together on surge capacity and surge planning uh, um, does not provide the kind of capacity that a hospital might need that we have the backstop of the alternate care facility to provide that uh, space and that availability uh, so that people who require hospitalization uh, can have access to it in a, in a way that uh, most uh, meets their uh, most meets their, the needs of what they uh, of the illness they are um, needing hospitalization for. Thank you, Danny. Now to Eric Gunn from Wisconsin Examiner. Eric. Eric Gunn? And a reminder, star six to unmute your phones. Okay, we'll try to get back to Eric if we have time. Uh, we'll move on then to Casey Nelson from WTAQ in Green Bay. Casey? 
Hi, thanks again for holding this call. A lot of schools across the state, and especially up here in Northeast Wisconsin, either start the whole year virtually or they're going back to a virtual model due to rising numbers in their communities and things like that. I mean, is there any kind of guidance from the state or DHS just for how schools can handle these kind of things and, and how even parents can handle uh, these, these situations to keep these numbers down and get kids back in the classroom at, at some point this year? Uh, yeah, we did, um, we did, Casey, provide uh, guidance uh, around um, outbreaks and thinking about if you identify cases in your school, what does that mean? Uh, what tools do you have? Um, how do you notify parents? Uh, uh, the kinds of mitigation, uh, you know, everything from cleaning uh, to other strategies that schools can employ um, so that you are able to um, either maintain in-person learning uh, because you, you are able to, you know, it, it's one classroom, it's not wide or spread, so how do you target that, for example? Um, or if you are virtual or go virtual because of an outbreak, uh, uh, um, the things you, the kinds of strategies and actions you can take uh, to return to in-person learning, if that's uh, what the what what local leadership at the school uh, is 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 striving to do. Um, but that that guidance is out; it is available, um, and and obviously we always are happy uh, to continue to work with uh, local public health and with schools as they face particular situations and have questions or. Um, uh, need need uh, further, you know, technical assistance from us. We are always uh, ready and available to do that kind of work as well. Thank you, Casey. Now to Jeremy Nichols from NBC 15 in Madison. Jeremy. Jeremy Nichols from NBC 15. Excuse me, this is Eric Gunn. My call dropped right when I was getting ready to ask my question. Is there time for me now? Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, several months ago, the state uh, DHS was looking to hire a thousand contract tracers. Uh, it's never been exactly clear what happened. We did not seem to achieve that uh, goal, and I'm wondering if you can lay out the specifics of uh, why that didn't happen uh, the way you had hoped it would and uh, what you may have learned to, to do differently from that. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, so our goal was to, um, was to hire a thousand contact tracers in the state of Wisconsin to do this work. We, um, with our local public health partners, uh, have about 1,200, 1,240 contact tracers statewide. Um, in, in conversations with local public health and in developing um, and surge, you know, building up the infrastructure for contact tracing uh, through the spring and into the summer, um, uh, uh, we provided funding to uh, local public health departments uh, for that hiring, for, you know, to get us to that thousand so that we in combination reached that goal. Um, we continue uh, together to need to surge those resources beyond the 1,200 and change, 1,240, I think, that we have now. Um, so today, uh, I think I mentioned, uh, we have an additional um, uh, 24 um, assets from uh, DHS that are going to surge into the system. We, will, we are hiring um, uh, additional tranches now. Uh, 60 of them will start next week, um, and we'll roll into the into following weeks with additional contact tracing assets. Uh, local communities continue also to, to staff up. Uh, um, uh, the University of Wisconsin continues to bulk up its contact tracing uh, staffing assets, um, r recognizing the surge and the need for all of us to have additional assets to do this work. Um, but again, I think uh, to the previous question about contact tracing, um, we, we are certainly at risk of overwhelming the public health system as it relates to our contact tracing, and it speaks only to the need for us uh, to do everything we can together to make choices individually to help stop the spread. So mask wearing, staying home as much as possible, um, the things that we know are effective, we need to be thoughtful and, and make the choice to do those things um, more vigilantly uh, and, and, and in more instances uh, here in the coming days and weeks to really um, get this under control and stop the spread. 
Thank you, Eric. Now to Steve Prestigard from the Platteville Journal. Steve? Thanks for uh, taking my question, um, which is uh, the, the news release that announced the extension of the mask order specifically mentioned uh, universities in <clears throat> the 1824 age group. So what I'm wondering is, is the state considering anything that is specifically tied to UW system campuses to um, stop the spread, such as uh, forcing the campuses to close uh, to in-person instruction and going to uh, virtual instruction sooner than they are originally planning or starting later next semester or whatever. Anything like that in the works? Well, we, we're on, we are, uh, my staff and uh, the former governor, Thompson staff at the University of Wisconsin system and, and the individual campuses communicate regularly on, on these types of decisions. So we, we believe that we have a good working relationship and that uh, we will continue to have that good working relationship and, and uh, utilize the plans that we, we are collectively uh, putting together to make sure that everybody, everybody's safe. So uh, as far as specific uh, interventions, uh, uh, that's something that we'll, we'll work with the system on in individual campuses. But most importantly, at this point in time, it's, it's making sure we get enough testing on those campuses, making sure that, uh, uh, that we have the contact tracing so that people can, can isolate and, and uh, not be spreading the disease to others. Uh, it, it, is, it's, it is something that I, I believe uh, with the proper, uh, proper effort on everybody's part, we will be able to together uh, solve this on the campuses. Thank you, Steve. And we have time for one more question today because of our hard out, and that belongs to Jeremy Janine from Urban Milwaukee. Jeremy. Uh, apologies, because I got to the call a bit late. We, uh, for Secretary Designee Palmer, maybe Dr. Westergaard, we are seeing a surge in active, ho active hospitalization, but the number of people newly hospitalized each day seems to be holding steady. That would seem to indicate that the average hospitalization is getting longer. Is there any sense to why that is? No, I don't believe we have data to, to describe the you know, factors related to length of stay. Uh, I think the ma clinical management of people with COVID-19 has, has um, evolved. I think a, a lot of critical care specialists feel like they have a, you know, a, a better equipped toolkit of treatments. There's evidence that using anti-inflammatory medicines such as you know, corticosteroids um, reduces deaths significantly, and we have one antiviral drug that has evidence. So, so as time has gone on, I think we've learned lessons that allow us to um, manage patients more successfully and prevent deaths in the hospitals. But in terms of the specific uh, trends that we've seen in Wisconsin, I'm not sure we can, we can attribute it to any one thing. And that concludes today's briefing. Please continue to monitor the DHS COVID-19 web pages for data and guidance. Additional information can be found on the websites of the Governor, the Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Children and Families, and Wisconsin Emergency Management. Be safe and have a great afternoon.